Okay, I think we can start. Harry, are you are you ready? Certainly. Okay, so um, so let's start. Uh, so welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, series of webinars that is promoted by Linea. And this is the uh, last webinar of, of the year. So, and we are very fortunate to have uh, uh, as a speaker today, uh, Dr. Harry Ferguson. So just say a few words about uh, Harry. He uh, did the AB in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard University and a PhD in physics and astronomy at the Johns Hopkins University. And since 1995, he has been on the scientific staff of the Space Telescope Science Institute, working in areas broadly related to galaxy evolution, observational cosmology. Uh, uh, he's a fellow of the American Society for Advancement of Science and serves as an at-large at member of the Astron Astronomy Section Steering Committee. And he also serves on the executive board of the LSST Corporation and is a co-investigator on the Expo Extra Galactic Science Investigation Team for the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And that's the uh, subject of the uh, of Henry's talk today. He's, he's going to talk about uh, exactly Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope and its synergies with LSST and other, other instruments as well. So Henry, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and uh, uh, th happy to talk about, have a chance to talk about uh, Roman, which is what I'm spending at least half my time on these days, although I must admit I'm getting distracted by James Webb Space Telescope as well these days. Um, my uh, functional position right now at Space Telescope is as the project scientist for the Roman data management system. Uh, and so sort of my day job, as, as it were, is to think about how to deal with the giant data volume that's going to be coming from this telescope. So um, I will give you a little bit of background um, and talk a bit about the science and then a little bit about the status and um, development. So for those who haven't heard of the Roman Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, it is a Hubble-like uh, telescope. So it's a 2.4 meter primary mirror it will be observing from optical to near infrared wavelengths um, with the sensitivity and resolution of Hubble. Um, but it has uh, a very large field of view. It's 0.28 square degrees with 18 detectors. Um, and it's also more efficient. So it has a, more than 200 times the survey efficiency of Hubble. Um, it will be obtaining in the wide field mode images in slitless spectra. In, it has a high contrast coronagraph for exoplanet studies right in the center of the focal plane. Um, and that uh, is, is considered a technology demonstration uh, part of the mission, but it is also going to be doing groundbreaking science on exoplanets. Launch is slated for late 2026 or early 2027. Um, and the data will be immediately public worldwide. The key drivers for the mission um, are multifold in some sense. So dark energy or general cosmology is going to be pursued with multiple techniques, baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, weak lensing, supernovae, clusters of galaxies, and other measures. Exoplanets will be pursued um, both through the coronagraph, which I just mentioned, and through um, a microlensing uh, survey of the galactic bulge. And I'll talk in detail about all of those things. And then in, there's many, many other things you can do with a wide field survey telescope uh, up outside of the atmosphere. And uh, the general astrophysics, um, in some sense, is still to be defined. Um, there'll be competitions as the mission progresses, um, although all of the data will be public from those competitions. Um, but uh, it'll be about 25% of the time that's in some sense still to be defined for all sorts of different science. So a little bit of the background of how we got here to the Roman Space Telescope. The, the idea of putting a wide area Hubble 
uh, in orbit uh, has been around a long time, even before um, Hubble launch, no doubt, but it really got a lot of uh, traction around 2000 with um, the idea of launching a, a probe to follow up on the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. And this was called the Supernova Acceleration Probe. And the U.S. Department of Energy was pursuing that um, rather vigorously at the time. Um, NASA got into the game a bit after the Department of Energy, and they joined forces somewhere in the middle of the 2000s decade uh, to create something they called the Joint Dark Energy Mission. There were a bunch of studies. One that was very influential was a, um, a scientific report that looked at figures of merit for how you decide you know, is is your particular experiment uh, doing the right thing for measuring dark energy? It's a little bit controversial, that report, because it's very hard to capture all of what you want to know in one figure of merit. But it was important because there were so many things being considered, not just by NASA, but for ground-based astronomy, including LSST, and, um, and in Europe, including uh, what became Euclid. Um, there were also funded concept studies for the Joint Dark Energy Mission, and they also laid the groundwork for what a lot, a lot of what ended up coming into uh, the Roman science plan. Um, there, there was a decade that we, the U.S. does these decadal surveys um, organized by the National Academy to set priorities, and um, their highest priority for the twenty. 10 decade was a thing they called W first, which was to uh, measure dark energy. It was a little bit of a pun there. Um, and uh, it seemed like JDAM might become the reality, but in, in 2012, there were two telescopes that were transferred to NASA from the uh, US National Reconnaissance Office. So they were spy telescopes basically that were made to point down. Um, they were about the size of, of Hubble um, and, and in, in many ways already built, um, in many ways not already built, but, but large aspects of that them were, um, were in place, including the primary mirror, pointing system, things of that sort. Um, these became known as the Astrophysics Focused Telescope Assets, AFTA, and, and for a while w, there was a W first hyphen AFTA acronym that was used for the, the evolution from JDEM. Um, 2016, WFIRST entered the formulation phase. There were science investigation teams selected to work on you know, detailed plans for the science and the survey and the requirements for the, the actual hard, hardware and operating you know, operations, working groups formed and so on. In 2020, the, the telescope was renamed um, and named after Nancy Grace Roman, who was in some sense the um, one of the key figures in Hubble's evolution. Um, she was the, the project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope for many years before launch and very influential in keeping it on track toward launch. Um, uh, 2021, uh, Roman passed the critical design review and we're now essentially well on track to launching, um, as I said, around 2026, 2027. Um, while, while focusing primarily on dark energy and exoplanets, one of the things we've learned from histories of discovery, and I like this one because um, one of my ancestors was involved, but there was a um, US exploring expedition in from 1838 to 1842 that set five ships out to explore, but also to project the U.S. Navy's prominence uh, in the world when it wasn't prominent. Um, and it uh, <laughs> laid claim to uh, discovering Antarctica, although that would be uh, disputed by the French because of the position of the international dateline and the ships at the time. Uh, but it also made some of the most important um, uh, maps of uh, geography of the of the world, uh, laid the foundations for plate tectonics. It brought back a collection that became the uh, Smithsonian Institution's collection uh, of flora and fauna in many ways. Um, 
the primary science object is one of the things that motivated the the, um, the mission, as it were, were was a um, theory that I don't think anyone particularly took seriously, but Edmund Halley was one of the people who did, um, that the Earth was hollow at the poles. Um, and so this was a mission to the pole, um, or at least was that was used to <laughs> as one of the justifications of sending uh, the, these ships to the pole. Um, and, and so one of the lessons learned is that sometimes the primary objectives are elusive, uh, but the discoveries made along the way can have lasting significance. And getting there definitely was not easy. The, the expenditure of this exploring expedition was roughly equivalent to the Apollo program in terms of the fraction of the gross national product that went toward it. Um, so Roman, in, in comparison, is a tiny uh, exploring expedition. Uh, core science, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there are three independent probes of dark energy, um, baryon acoustic oscillations, supernovae, weak lensing, exoplanets has the microlensing and the chronograph, and then general astrophysics is, is in some sense everything else, and I will give you examples of all of these. Survey designs, um, so the science investigation teams uh, looked at um, different possible surveys, um, partly to create a de design reference mission that you could use to test that your operations concepts were actually gonna work and be achievable in five years, and um, also to set the requirements <coughs> for calibration and so on. Uh, so the high latitude survey is notionally 2000 square degrees and multiple broad bands spanning 0.5 to two microns. Uh, accompanied with slitless spectroscopy with a resolution about 300. Um, the high latitude time domain survey uh, is two components, a wide, which is roughly 20 square degrees, and a deep, roughly five square degrees. Um, multiple bands, once again, where the deep focused on somewhat higher redshift, so slightly redder bands. Roughly 145 um, contiguous epochs, so it will be in a continuous viewing zone um, for each of those. Galactic time, bulge time domain survey for microlensing in particular, but all sorts of other astrophysics is, covers two square degrees uh, in six seasons with 62 days per season, observing at a 15 minute cadence for the full 62 days. Um, so that is a massive uh, time domain data set. Um, coronography will get about 20% of the time and target uh, nearby exoplanets and exodiacal systems. Um, the general astrophysics, as I say, will be uh, defined later by some sort of time allocation process and is conceived to be roughly about 30 surveys per year, none of which would have proprietary time, but that they would be defined um, by proposals. Um, the actual survey designs for these core surveys, the ones that I mentioned before, the general astrophysics, are, are being decided by an open community process, really most of it taking place over the coming year. Um, so Roman is complementary to Rubin and Euclid. Um, it has a smaller field of view than either, um, just for comparison, the uh, LSST field of view is the, the giant blue one. Um, some of the favorite uh, big fields with Hubble are shown, the candles, uh, slices, um, and the uh, cosmos, which is the widest area ever observed by Hubble. They fit comfortably within the LSST field of view. Uh, the Roman field of view is, of course, much smaller than LSST. Um, uh, but it has the resolution of Hubble. It can do, so Candle's um, survey, which I was heavily involved in, um, was the largest survey um, carried out with Hubble and took about um, three months of total observing time. Roman could do that in about a day um, with, with its instrumentation. Um, so it has... Um, as I say, multiple broadbands uh, outlined here, this uh, grism uh, R of 300 spectroscopy and then a low resolution prism as well, 
um, which is primarily intended for getting supernova follow-up spectra. So it's a quite low resolution, but it might also be useful for galaxy science. Um, the sensitivity compared to uh, Euclid and LSST is shown here at the right. Um, and so much more sensitive than, than Euclid and, and actually quite complementary to LSST in that it uh, extends uh, at roughly comparable sensitivity down to two microns. Uh, and this is just a comparison of the optical image quality compared to a, a typical ground-based um, uh, image. So uh, there is a, a at least one report, but one that, that really looked explicitly at synergies between Roman and Rubin. And that is, um, as a was put on the archive as a preprint in 2022. So there's lots of, of sort of complementary projects that use both data sets uh, that were outlined in that report, as well as sort of various work items that would need to be accomplished to make these two uh, facilities work well together. And I would say uh, there's a lot of work yet to do <laughs> to, to realize those. Um, so now a little bit of background on the on the science. Um, so the cosmology, um, of course, we we have a standard cosmological framework, which is uh, this weird universe that we live in, where um, dark energy or dark matter and dark energy constitute almost everything, um, and we don't know what either of those are. Um, and then the rest of it is uh, just sort of five percent. Um, and um, we, we have very good constraints on uh, this being the cosmology from the cosmic, cosmic microwave background, from chemical abundances, from distance versus redshift. But we don't know what dark matter is, what drives the cosmic acceleration. Is the theory of gravity even right? There are current tensions even in this standard model between the, the estimates of the expansion rate from the local Hubble constant measurements and the cosmic microwave background. And there are tensions uh, in estimates of the amplitude of matter fluctuations um, measured by galaxy clustering. Um, in any case, um, this is the cosmic microwave background with these beautiful uh, bumps and wiggles that give us uh, high confidence that the essential aspects of this theory are right. And these fluctuations are the seeds of galaxies and indeed are well reproduced by n-body simulations and cosmological simulations. Um, so the large scale structure is reproduced uh, incredibly well um, and can be used as a tool. Um, so there are complementary uh, measures of dark energy proposed using um, cosmic shear galaxy clustering, um, evolution of galaxy cluster number densities, um, and baryon acoustic oscillations and supernovae. Um, these all um, sort of will be uh, advanced and in and uh, complementary um, in to other facilities when when carried out by Roman. Um, so the high latitude imaging survey will measure galaxy shapes for weak lensing. It'll measure galaxy positions for 2D clustering. It'll measure photometric redshifts. Um, you can identify galaxy clusters. Um, and then, of course, all sorts of cross correlations of um, clusters and, and clustering and weak lensing. Um, and other probes that one can use, like peak statistics, magnification, cluster clustering, voids, high order statistics, and so on. Um, the mapping capability just compared. So um, depending on where you sit on uh, optimism for LSST, um, the kind of mass matter map resolution you might get out would be somewhere between 15 galaxies per square minute or 30 galaxies per square minute um, uh, in a typical wide high latitude survey field you'll have about 45 uh, galaxies per square arc minute um, so it gives you higher spatial resolution basically in your mass maps 
And then if you do some deep fields, you can get even higher resolution. Um, the galaxy samples um, are, it's pretty well understood from Hubble surveys what can be done. So we can divide into, let's say, 10 bins of redshift with reasonably understood um, redshift distributions in each bin um, and, and get for um, weak lensing somewhere between, you know, I'd say, 45 to 65, depending on what you're doing, uh, galaxies per square minute. Um, current state of the art, just in one parameter um, axis, set of axes, for looking at the uh, equation of state of dark energy versus its time for time derivative, or redshift derivative, is um, these are the contours, and the cosmological constant is is where the uh, crosshairs meet. Um, so current observations are consistent with dark energy being cosmological constant, um, but we would certainly like to know if it differs either in its time evolution or in, in its equation of state since the cosmological constant itself, we don't quite understand you know, why it should be the value it has. Um, so here are some projections for Roman, uh, including one or more of the probes. So if you just use weak lensing, um, then you get the dashed brown lines. If you uh, use all the probes together, uh, you get the very small black contours in the middle. Um, and then if you cross it with Euclid and LSST, you get even smaller contours. So we will be down in certainly in the era, era of precision cosmology, um, where we are uh, either honing in exactly on the cosmological constant or showing that there's some tension there. Um, the, as I mentioned, there's a current tension on the amplitude of matter fluctuations. Um, and this is sort of the current situation that um, the Planck uh, measurements of these matter fluctuations from the cosmic microwave background are in mild tension with uh, measurements from of the clumpiness of the universe from weak lensing. Um, this, this is the projection for where Roman would end up. Um, and so that tension will either be shown to be real or um, they will nicely line up. Um, synergies with the Rubin Observatory. Um, of course, one huge synergy is uh, Roman is infrared primarily, LSST is optical primarily, and you need accurate photometric redshifts for weak lensing tomography. The obvious thing to do is combine photometry for the best photometric redshifts. Um, that requires actually, or really benefits from um, processing the pixels together, um, meaning that you convolve the uh, Roman data to appropriate point spread functions and measure through apertures so that you know about, you've dealt with confusion and aperture problems um, in some sensible way. Um, there are no specific plans yet for how or where to do that processing. So that's a, something still to be decided, but everybody knows it's needed. Um, other ideas, so the, as I say, the, the Roman um, sort of default plan is a 2000 square degree survey, um, but one possibility is to use Roman, say over five or six months to cover the whole LSST footprint with a shallow observation. And there could be benefits to doing that, um, or there could be uh, other possibilities of combining um, a wide uh, single band survey with Roman with, with um, LSST. Um, the high latitude spectroscopic survey will use this near IR GRISM um, and cover also the 2000 square degrees, in, uh, including at least notionally a, a deep component, um, mostly for calibration purposes. Um, it'll have an emission line flux limit of 10 to the minus 16. Um, so, so it'll 
give about 10 million galaxies in H alpha with um, redshifts between one and two, and about two million galaxies detected in O3 with redshifts of two to three. Um, a slitless spectroscopy, the spectra all overlap. So there is a um, challenging data analysis problem to deal with the source confusion. Um, on the other hand, source confusion, if you're looking primarily for emission lines, is not uh, nearly as bad as it, as it is if you are trying to analyze the continuum spectrum. Um, so here are the projections for baryon acoustic oscillations. So the baryon acoustic oscillation peak is really the, the first acoustic peak of the, the cosmic microwave background that was imprinted on galaxy clustering. So it's a preferred scale to cl of clustering that's at about 100 megaparsecs, which is projected about the size of the full moon. Um, and um, that measures cosmic distance or is a measure of cosmic distance um, or a measure of the fluctuations. Um, so Roman is really primarily probing the high redshift uh, regime. Um, so this is Roman compared to current uh, experiments um, and compared to the DESI project, which is going on now, which is a ground-based spectroscopic um, BAO survey, um, DESI will get uh, exquisite uh, BAO measurements out to redshifts almost two, and Roman and, and, and at some level Euclid. Um, so Euclid is is going to be very impactful out to sort of a little bit above redshift of two, and then Roman's sort of uniqueness space is above redshift of two. And then that it's complementary to the other uh, projects doing things somewhat differently um, in the space where it, where they overlap. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so this is uh, gives a just a sort of visual comparison of the higher surface density that you can get with the larger telescope on Roman, so you'll have many more galaxies with spectra uh, in any given patch of the sky. Um, and uh, therefore, you can do all sorts of things with small scale clustering, which is uh, harder to interpret for cosmology, but very interesting, uh, nonetheless, for uh, testing uh, gravity, as, as well as understanding uh, galaxy formation and how galaxies are um, um, embedded in dark matter halos and things of that sort, as well as for testing for systematics. Uh, supernovae, so the time domain survey will be measuring supernovae. Um, we need to be looking for differences at the millimagnitude level uh, to really be doing interesting cosmology. And um, even with current surveys, there are hints of systematics um, and so one of the big uh, goals for the supernova survey, which will have um, well-sampled light curves and spectra, is to get at some of the uh, systematic questions and really make these into um, very uh, probes that can be used with, with high confidence. So the reference survey will have 5,000 su supernovae at redshifts greater than one. Um, and um, light curve sampling is sort of what's shown here. So well sampled light curves at all the redshifts in multiple bands to get at this, this sort of systematic questions. Um, the observations will probe the, con will be in the continuous viewing zone somewhere. Um, and, and the continuous viewing zone is, is a pretty wide swath um, at the sort of roughly around the ecliptic poles um, and includes some of the um, interesting fields from other facilities. So most likely the supernova uh, survey would be centered on one of the well-studied fields, but it's in some sense TBD where, it, where exactly it, it ends up. Um, th this just shows uh, sort of the projected redshift distribution of supernovae from the wide and the deep surveys. 
and the fractional distance uncertainty that um, that comes out of that. The Galactic Bulge Time Domain Survey um, is pointed at an area um, of roughly two square degrees uh, in the Galactic Bulge, um, and its primary goal is to look for uh, microlensing, um, which happens when a um, foreground star passes in front of a star that's in the bulge. Um, and if there's a planet around that foreground star, you get a secondary blip in the light curve. And that secondary blip is the signature of the planet. In principle, you can also find planets that are not around uh, parent stars as smaller blips um, or free floating black holes. And there's all sorts of other science. So compared to sort of current exoplanet or other exoplanet searches, uh, the um, searches with um, transits and um, coronography at some level are, are really searching a small area um, close to the parent star. Um, and the um, and that that's sort of within the orbit of Mars. And Roman is sensitive to sort of the whole solar system. Um, this is the kind of light curve that one will get out of the Galactic Bulge Time Domain Survey. Um, and you can see you can use that data to fit uh, for properties of the planet. Um, we expect something like 2,600 planets with something like 350 of them being roughly Earth, Earth mass. Um, and so really it will be getting the statistics of planets in a regime where we can't get the statistics of planets um, from our current facilities. Um, another interesting um, benefit of doing this survey is finding isolated black holes. So our census of black holes is actually quite highly biased. So this is, we detect things by seeing them merge, finding x-rays um, from binaries. There are also gravitational indications of detached binaries. And there's one uh, known isolated black hole that was seen with microlensing uh, this past year. Um, the expected population is, is mostly isolated and detached. So we really have, are, have not probed the population of black holes that's likely to be floating around in our galaxy. Um, one of the ways you can find them is with astrometric microlensing. So these are long duration time um, microlensing events. They take uh, many hundreds of days. So they're distinguishable from the typical planetary transits. Um, and they actually deflect the position of the, the star enough that you can measure it um, with, with Roman as it's been done for, for Hubble. Um, so the expectation is we could find, depending on the observing strategy, anywhere from 30 to 250 or so isolated free-floating black holes. <clears throat> the coronagraph, um, as I say, is, a, is, is considered a technology demonstration part of the mission. Um, it is a uh, um, state-of-the-art coronagraph with uh, a deformable mirror. Um, to achieve contrasts of order a billion or one in a billion um, in the flux ratio of the planet to the host star. Um, so this shows where it fits relative to uh, current facilities. And this is a simulation of what an uh, exoplanet system, a known exoplanet system looks like. I don't remember which one, unfortunately. Um, it has um, imaging and polarimetry. It has some uh, low resolution spectroscopy um, and it covers uh, this wavelength range primarily from um, uh, 5,000 angstroms to about 9,000 angstroms. Uh, this just sort of shows the somewhat complex optical design. Um, goodness. Don't know why PowerPoint just crashed. Well, it happens to the best uh, of the families. <laughs> that was interesting.
see where I am here. Um, okay, so there's the chronograph optical design. Um, as I, I mentioned, these observing modes, um, and this is just an example of absorption line spectroscopy um, that could be achieved with the, um, the um, low resolution spectrograph. Um, other science that there's there's huge amount of science that can be done with the core surveys so that and and that data or that those data are accessible to everyone the the data are in some sense available within roughly 20 40, 48 hours um but to be really sort of useful um there will be data releases and those will come sort of periodically, sort of semi-annually or annually, probably at a different cadence for each survey. Um, Astroseismology is one of the areas that um, uh, the bulge is gonna be amazing for um, in principle one, or um, it seems like one will be able to get masses and radii from astroseismology measurements uh, for more than a million stars, mostly giants and bulge. Um, astrometric measurements are extremely interesting. Um, this sort of shows, and it's a very complicated diagram, but it shows the, the proper motion and then the distance that you would have and the sensitivity of LSST for a K3 star, Gaia for a K3 star, um, and then um, Roman after five years um, at, at various um uh, Roman alone, I guess, uh, is this the yellow. And then if you have fields that have been observed with HST over the its lifetime, then you get uh, a, a longer longer time baseline and you can be doing proper motions out um, in, the, you know, well out into um, beyond the local group. Um, so science cases for astrometry, motions of dwarf satellites, motions of stars in the Milky Way halo, the subhalo mass function, um, which is partly what you're getting from the dwarf satellites, um, detection of ex and characterization of exoplanets by their astrometric motion, um, structure of the Milky Way bulge, star formation, isolated black holes and neutron stars, and the internal kinematics of globular clusters. Um, the wide area high latitude survey will be um, useful for all sorts of galaxy evolution studies, um, mass functions, how do you um, connect stellar masses and halo masses using clustering, using independent estimates from weak lensing. Uh, samples will be large enough to split by morphology, color, emission lines, so on and so forth. Um, uh, emission lines will also reveal uh, star formation rates, um, constrain extinction and metallicities, and of course give us uh, huge samples of active galactic nuclei and ability to tie those to their host properties and measure clustering. Um, transients, in addition to the type 1a supernovae, we will have um, the ability to look at um, long duration supernovae in particular, ones that are interesting at super high redshift uh, pair instability supernovae, which might be a probe of even um, first generations of stars. Um, it will find kilonovae um, and there are all sorts of other kinds of transients that have been observed already with Spitzer in the infrared, um, including uh, various kinds of luminous variables, novae, um, and AGN. Um, also of particular interest is lensed supernovae, which um, can be found um, both by Roman, but also potentially, you know, found by other facilities, LSST, for example, and then followed up in great detail by Roman. And these give you um, powerful independent constraints on uh, cosmological parameters. Um, then there are, of course, the astrophysics surveys that can be uh, designed um, by the community um, beyond these core surveys. Um, this is just an example of um, a single field projected on the Andromeda galaxy. 
Um, and uh, so you can do the entire um, FAT survey uh, once again in less than a day. Um, uh, and the kind of uh, resolution that you get allows you to make color magnitude diagrams and, and you know, find clusters and so on uh, in great detail over the whole face of that galaxy and hundreds of nearby galaxies. Um, satellite galaxies um, um, will be able to probe down to um, very small absolute magnitudes or masses, um, and so pushing down further than um, Ruben will be able to do out um, to somewhat larger distances. So these are satellite galaxies around nearby galaxies. That's a way of probing the, the halo mass function at some level, or the um, at least the very unpopulated halo mass function. Um, and so that uh, Roman can can push this out to distances of 10 megaparsecs and, and somewhat smaller uh, luminosities. Um, it'll be great for studying star forming regions in our own galaxy. Um, and there are um, certainly suggestions that the telescope ought to be used to survey the whole plane of the galaxy. Um, and, and I imagine that might happen, but there are no specific plans. So this was one white paper that was put, uh, put out there with a, an idea for how you might do this. Um, and um, <laughs> together, Roman and Ruben um, can uh, basically map stars and dust through the entire Milky Way plane, even out beyond the other and beyond the bulge uh, because of the infrared sensitivity. Um, for the solar system, um, there are all sorts of interesting populations of, gal of, of small bodies, uh, Earth Trojans, Trojans, or, or other kinds of satellites in orbit around the giant planets, uh, the trans-Neptunian objects that are smaller than uh, in sort of the small end of the size distribution, which isn't well probed by current studies, and then just more distant um, objects. Uh, there's an interesting suggestion out there to use the guide windows, which read out at about six hertz, um, to as a stellar occ occultation uh, measuring uh, engine um, where you might be able to do um, interesting studies of small uh, uh, solar system objects, um, which might even happen serendipitously, but you could also plan them. Uh, so a little bit on the hardware status. Um, the There are 18 flight detectors. They've all been selected. They've all been integrated into the camera. The camera has been um, uh, put in uh, to thermal vacuum testing, um, and the data from that are uh, currently being analyzed. Um, uh, so everything's going very well on the detector front and on the wide field imager front. Um, the primary mirror is all put together um, and being integrated at Goddard Space Flight Center. As this is the top end of the telescope, uh, secondary mirror. Um, uh, and and really, the hardware is proceeding quite well with um, further campaigns of you know increasingly ambitious thermal vacuum testing coming up over the the coming year year and a half. Um, the science operations and data management system. So it's split um, the um, the IPAC. Uh, in, on the West Coast, which was responsible for Spitzer, is responsible for some aspects of the um, operations and the data analysis. And the Space Telescope Science Institute, where I work, is responsible for other aspects. So at the Institute, we're responsible for the planning and scheduling of the observations, the calibration of the wide field imaging, um, and then we are the archive for, the, for all of the data. Uh, it is a lot of data. It's about um, uh, every week getting 100 times what Hubble has gotten over its whole mission. Um, both catalogs and pixel level data sets are going to be uh, used by the entire world community. Um, 
and the downloading and processing ex if you really want to use even you know a fraction of the high latitude surveys um, exceeds the resources that typically have people have available so we're planning to have a platform um, on the Amazon cloud and people will be able to have accounts on that <laughs> and a sort of an entry level account that's suitable for analyzing sort of a square degree or so um, that anyone can request um, just as easily as you can get what's called an MIST account for 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 Hubble but it basically um, um, there's no proposal required to get um, a few hundred hours of computing um, and some data storage um, and that's available worldwide um, the the actual cloud computing is happening in the east region of AWS so that that data access to the CPU will be very fast um, but if you're operating across the internet you know interactivity may be uh, not what you get on your laptop um, the calibrated the science data products include calibrated images spectra catalogs um, and then the, the pipeline is all open source and modular so people can customize it um, this just gives you a little bit more uh, view of the data management um, IPAC, in addition to um, doing the um, wide lab, the so they're doing the processing for micro lensing and they're processing for the slitless spectroscopy. Um, they're really responsible for the whole CGI, not only the data analysis, but a lot of the instrumentation uh, is happening at, at JPL, which is you know, closely associated with IPAC. Um, and then all that data comes back. And so it goes over to, to the West Coast and then comes back um, and comes into this cloud um, facility. Um, we have various things in development here, um, including a simulations package to simulate um, very realistic uh, uh, images um, from the wide field imager. There's a thing called Roman iSIM that uh, is now available on GitHub, but is still under heavy development. Um, and there's also idealized simulations that are sort of what a calibrated image looks like, as opposed to one that has all of the instrument signatures in it. Um, and there's a simulator available for that. Um, the simulator that's being developed for the low level stuff will be um, uh, compatible with the GALSIM simulator that's used for LSST simulations uh, <clears throat> and can also do the idealized simulations um, itself. Um, there's a point spread function um, simulator that's called WebPSF that also simulates James Webb point spread function. And then there will be an empirical library uh, during the mission. Um, we are planning to calibrate everything as well as possible to Gaia, um, make multi-band um, PSF match catalogs, include photometric redshifts, but at, at the Science Center only basing on Roman data. So one of the things that um, the community is responsible for at some level is combining the other data sets um, to get you photometric redshifts across multiple facilities. Now we will be doing some variable source catalogs based on different imaging, but not in real time. Those are um, uh, something that at least our funded concept is coming out on the sort of six month to year data release time scale. There is a, a now a funded effort to see if that can be sped up um, from an external team. Um, and then there will be community contributed product products, including photometric redshifts, various value added catalogs, um, improved calibrations that essentially use some kind of self calibration using the whole survey, um, and then window functions, PSF kernels, things like that. Um, currently out of scope for for our development at the institute is. Um, producing these high-level products so that uh, external teams are responsible for those. And then joint processing with uh, external data sets, in particular with um, LSST and Euclid. Um, that's still out of scope, I would say, for anyone uh, at the moment. Um, I thought there is a plan now 
in being worked to do some joint processing between Euclid and LSST. Um, and then we still haven't figured out what other than Roman, what other products we will put in the cloud. Almost certainly we will put some other products there, but it's um, to be determined and to be funded. Um, so ways to get involved. Um, there's a, um, a sort of a main website. So if you write down one thing and then want to go search, this is the best one to go to, the Roman website at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, a, a few things you'll find there. There's the Roman Community Forum, um, which uh, is uh, we uh, roughly monthly uh, online series that gives a status update and um, any news, basically. There is an ongoing call for community input for core community surveys. And that um, call is... It, it, the stage right now is committees are being formed based on um, some white papers that were submitted and some self-nominations of committee members. Once those committees are formed, there will no doubt be some outreach to the general community uh, for further ideas or feedback on um, the design of the core surveys. And then there are some technical working groups, um, in particular one on software and calibration, and there's one that will be formed or reformed on simulations. Um, I mentioned this, so the, the other one, there, there is a Roman mailing, Roman news mailing list. I think you will find links to that on this website. So this is the one thing you should remember. And, I, and then there's a virtual lecture series um, once a month. Uh, that's just a half hour. Um, there are regular science workshops um, at least once a year, um, just talking about, you know, science topics for the whole mission. Those are usually roughly three day workshops. And that is all I had prepared and I'm open for questions. So thank you very much, Harry, for this very comprehensive uh, and exciting uh, talk because there's so many scientific aspects uh, that are going to be studied by uh, Roman and also the possibilities of synergies with so many other um, uh, experiments such as LSST. So that's really incredible. Okay, so now we have time for uh, questions. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your virtual hand or your real hand. <laughs> you can see that. Any questions? Anna, please. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk, it was very nice. Uh, I was wondering uh, if there are any MOUs or general agreements to observe uh, some targeted fields uh, together with the Chinese Space Station Telescope, the CSST? There are not. Um, it's an interesting <laughs> thought. The, the only um, agreement along those lines is uh, with Subaru, um, who have uh, offered to put 100 nights toward complementary measurements, primarily with the prime focus spectrograph um, to help with the uh, uh, cosmology, photometric redshift calibration, things of that sort. And the details of, of that have yet to be defined, but the scope is roughly 100 nights. Uh, uh, Nicolasi? I, uh, well, thank you very much, Henry. It was fantastic. Uh, let me ask you, how long the, the mission is supposed to be? So the no, the nominal mission is five years. Um, the, 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 I believe there are no expendables. I could be wrong. I don't, I don't remember how the, the pointing is actually done. But, uh, you know, in principle, it could be a very long mission if nothing breaks. And uh, L2, I forgot to mention. So, um, so you said that it generates a lot of data. How, what, what kind of data volume are we talking about on a yearly basis? Um, it's about a petabyte a year when it all adds up. Okay. Thank you. So, all the processing will be made on the cloud. 
I, I didn't catch the question. Uh, all, all the processing? Oh, no, automatic. Oh, yeah, right? so no, um, it's a little bit mixed, and I think it may evolve. At the moment, the instrument signature removal part, which we call level two, that calibration we are doing for the wide field imager at Space Telescope on premises. Um, and, and the reason for that is the way the pipeline for James Webb was designed um, relies on other subsystems of our <laughs> in, in our planning system at some level. Um, and it, if we didn't want to port everything to the cloud. Um, I think that may change. There are good reasons why we might want to move that to the cloud, um, but we don't yet have a plan to do that. Uh, everything after that would would take place on, on Amazon. And so we would transfer the level two data to the cloud, and then we would do all subsequent processing ourselves there, and the community could do any subsequent processing there. Community wants to, for instance, as, as an example, run Markov Chain Monte Carlo uh, using data from um, Roman. Is that going to be, there's going to be space, uh, I mean, time for, for the community to do that uh, also on the Amazon cloud? In principle, yes. So we've we we have budgeted for, I would say, reasonably ambitious, but no doubt underscoped relative to people's imaginations, <laughs> um, amounts of computing in the cloud. Um, so uh, it, we we looked at what we thought really people would want to do when they needed to access pixels, which is really the main reason you need to be in the cloud. And um, and so we have plans that people get these a few hundred hours of CPU and, you know, tens of gigabytes of, of personal storage without asking. They just, you know, go to a web and they get an account. And then if they want a bit more like typical of a, of a Hubble observing program. So 10 square degrees or something like that. Um, and um, several thousand hours, they would have to write sort of a little one page justification on a web form, but they wouldn't have to write a proposal to NASA. And then for the ambitious things, there would be the NASA proposals where you would sort of get them as part of your grant and then there would be some process yet to be defined for people who don't have grants to justify the larger needs, and then they can be weighed against the available resources. So there'll be some sort of process because, of course, resources will be limited in the end. Um, the, the nice thing at some level about using Amazon is that um, one doesn't have to get NASA funding or anything else to get NASA to get to buy Amazon time. So if if somebody got their own Amazon funding, and as long as they're in the East region, they have high bandwidth access to all the data. Um, and so in principle, you can have other funding sources and you know unlimited computing resources with the same bandwidth. Okay, so what, one more question that I have is about the international participation at Roman. How, how is that being organized? So there's certain formal pieces of it um, in the sense that, um, as I mentioned, Japan has um, has put in this, this 100 night contribution. Um, I don't believe I don't know that there's any special status as far as you know scientists from Japan goes there. Um, they may have, there may be some um, JAXA, you know, NAS, uh, Japan Space Agency contribution of, I don't know. I don't know what, in some sense, what's in it for Japan other than uh, really helping with the overall thing. I'm not sure what the, uh, that is the um, European Space Agency is um, contributing in small ways, but much smaller than for uh, Web. So Web, they're twenty five percent of the funding. 
Um, they're a very small um, operation for Rome and with just a few people involved, basically funded as, as scientists. So they will have some sort of European coordination, but it'll be much smaller scale than, than for. And then there are no um, sort of MOUs or anything else needed because the data are all public. Um, so, you know, how people get resources to analyze them becomes now, in some sense, your local problem. <laughs> and maybe there can be collaborations on, you know, proposals, but usually, uh, at least NASA and I think funding agencies in general don't want to send money across national borders. So it tends to be more local. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions for Henry? So I don't see any uh, hands up. So this uh, is sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I have yes. a question. Uh, yes, I I was trying to raise my hand. <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> Henry. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice nice talk. Um, I I have two questions. First, uh, do you plan uh, since you are doing uh, microlensing surveys, do you plan to uh, study also binary stars because I think the the signal will be very strong. To make yeah, it a... will be. I mean, I, I the the group that is um, sort of leading or has been leading the design of that core survey has been primarily focused on microlensing and is well aware there's all sorts of other astrophysics. Um, I don't know that there's a group that's formed yet that has been, you know, looking really specifically at binary stars, which are, of course, of great interest there as well as the astroseismology. But yeah. Yeah, thanks. And the, the other question is uh, regarding the broadband uh, spectrum. Do you think it would be possible to build spectral density profiles for, for instance, uh, solar system objects, giving the, the cadence and the exposure times, maybe to study this type of object? I haven't thought about that. I, I mean, I, I, I think so. You're thinking about the slitless spectroscopy for transnode tuning objects or small yes. solar system bodies. Yes. I think, in principle, um, I, they they move, so it's a little bit of a challenge. But um, yeah, I think I mean they will be there, so you'll get a spectrum of them for free if they're bright enough. Yeah. Yeah. Because since they're so. Uh, we don't uh, we do not have man, much information on on their properties. Maybe it could yeah. be interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone really. Um, I, I mean, I haven't followed all that, but I the various things that I've seen on the social system. I haven't seen people look at that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Harry? So otherwise, let's thank Henry again for this very nice uh, talk on, on Nancy and, and synergies with other experiments. And uh, reminding everybody that this is uh, our last webinar of the year. And also that these webinars are recorded and uh, they are available at the home, at the uh, site homepage of Linea. So um, yeah, so I, we'll see you uh, next year then. No, I want to wish everybody Happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks.